please join me in welcoming our distinguished speaker, Ms. Madeline Nolte. So, 
I'm going to get a little bit technical so you guys can understand why that's so special. The physical layer design is basically the transmission system. It significantly increases the capacity of the signal. More bits going through the same bandwidth and or stronger signals reaching more people in more places, indoors, greater distances, and on the go. And I say and or because this system is flexible. Broadcasters have, well, more. And they can use their more on better signal strength or more data or both. So if you consider a 4K service that requires a lot of data, this could be a weaker signal intended for fixed antennas and big screens. But they could also have a mobile service. This would need to be a stronger signal, but standard depth resolution works well for smaller screens, so less data is needed. There are thousands of possible configurations, and the standard allows for up to 64 different configurations to be used at the same time. So broadcasters don't actually have to choose. They can walk and chew gum at the same time. I'm going to have part of my signal is going to be for a 4K service, and part of my signal is going to be data casting to cars. Who knows? In other words, so if you compare this with ATSC 1.0, which only allows one configuration. So in other words, ATSC 1.0 is based on a single carrier system, while ATSC 3.0 is a multi-carrier system. So I'm going to use a football analogy because I'm from Boston and we watch football. Okay. So if you think about it this way, imagine a football team and you have one huge player on offense. And his job is to carry the ball, which is the TV signal, over the goal line, which is the receivers, despite the defense, which is all the signal interference which is going to happen on play. He is very hard to stop, but if the defense gets in the way enough to stop the one carrier, the signal is lost. Now imagine a football team with many smaller players, each with a ball, all swarming toward the goal line, using different strategies and different routes. <coughs> the defense may stop some of them, but as long as a critical mass of them make it across the goal line, reception is strong. This multi-carrier system is also important for evolvability. When ATSC members realized that a non-backward compatible system was needed, they set a requirement that the new system would allow for graceful and gradual adoption of new technologies without the need for another completely non-backward compatible transition. We don't want to do this ever again. We really don't. So, returning to the analogy, you can imagine a portion of the football players carrying 3.0 footballs and a portion carrying something new. So the 3.0 receivers will continue to get services while newer receivers could be rendering both 3.0 and newer content. Another major change in ATSC 3.0 is that it's the world's first IP-based digital terrestrial broadcast system, meaning that the data layer uses internet protocol, which is the same digital language used for internet communications. That means that broadcast and broadband services can be interchangeably combined or converged. Basically, in a digital world, all data is simply ones and zeros. Video, audio, captions, software updates, map data, everything. So now broadcasters can transmit more than television services, and this opens up new business models powered by data casting, since internet protocol is used for any and all data. The IP-based system allows us to envision new nationwide wireless data delivery network. Not every use case is perfect for broadcast data casting because 3.0 remains a one-way, downlink-only system, and any return data must travel over a different network, such as the internet or cellular network. These additional networks are often available, though, such as in connected cars or connected televisions, and heck, I guess crockpots are connected these days, and who knows what else. So uh, ATSC 3.0 has this opportunity to become this new nationwide wireless IP data delivery. Um, before I go on, I just want to address a couple of myths about next-gen TV, because sometimes when people think IP, they ask this question. You do not need an internet connection to watch next-gen TV. Okay. You, if you have an internet connection, some enhanced services are possible, but you don't need it. Next one that comes up sometimes, next-gen TV is free, regardless of whether the content is encrypted. Devices that have the next-gen TV logo come equipped to present both encrypted and unencrypted services. Consumers do not have to do anything, and it is absolutely seamless for the consumer. Okay, myth busting done. So these flexible characteristics make ATSC 3.0 very attractive here in the U.S. and elsewhere in the world. Around the globe, different countries have different motivations and different primary use cases. South Korea had a government-mandated launch in 2017 using newly allocated spectrum with the primary use case of 4K over-the-air broadcasting 
in time for the 2018 Winter Olympics. And by goodness, they did it. How lucky are they to have all that spectrum? Wow. They were the first country to launch ATSC-3. And the U.S., as you know, is in the midst of an industry-driven launch that started in 2020 with the primary use case of successfully competing in the new media landscape by offering better TV services and developing new businesses with non-TV services, such as data casting. Jamaica has started a mandatory transition as the first country moving directly from analog to 3.0. When we heard that Jamaica was going to adopt ATSC 3.0, guess what the first thing people said to me was? Can we have a board meeting in Jamaica? <laughs> sure. <laughs> but they're most interested in having multiple services in a given RF band for more content and distance education, especially in the wake of COVID, because they were on analog and broadcasters struggled to deliver education content for all the grades and all the schools because they could only do one service per RF allocation. Trinidad and Tobago are following suit. They've announced adoption and more Caribbean nations are considering their options as well. Another country that's very exciting is Brazil. They are about to undergo a mandated transition. They are in the process of selecting technologies for their new system, which they're calling TV 3.0. That's kind of nice. Most of the components have been selected from ATSC 3.0 so far. Their primary use case is better television and ultra-efficient use of spectrum. Remember, the broadcast search can balance capacity versus throughput. So while South Korea is using ATSC 3.0 and optimizing throughput, they're even experimenting with 8K broadcasts using channel bonding. <coughs> Brazil, on the other hand, is optimizing for robustness. So imagine two broadcasters operating in adjacent markets each with the same spectrum allocation, transmitting different content, of course. Now imagine you've got a home located on the border between the two markets with a simple, non-directional receiver antenna. They want that receiver to be able to tune to both services, distinguishing between the two, even though they're roughly equal strength and in the same channel. Not so simple. Very, very efficient. This allows them to reuse spectrum that might otherwise need to be vacant of TV <coughs> services. Another interesting country is India. India's public broadcaster needs to offer direct-to-mobile services. There are 1.2 billion cell phones in India. And people watch both time-shifted and linear television on their phones. And this presents a growing congestion problem for mobile operators and a consumer device problem for the broadcaster. Both parties are motivated to find a solution for direct-to-mobile broadcasting so that the mobile operator can offload linear video traffic <coughs> and the broadcaster can reach people on their preferred devices. They're currently experimenting with ATSC 3.0. They have signals on the air in Delhi and Bengaluru, and they have transposed ATSC 3.0 into local technical standards. <coughs> India has not made any decisions about whether to go a new system, and if so, to which one. But we're very excited by the progress they're making, and if nothing else, we're all going to learn something about what they're doing. Canada will be likely be interested in 5G 3.0 converged services. Companies like Bell Media and Rogers are vertically integrated with both broadcast and cellular operatings. Operatings. Similar to India, they are experimenting with ATSC 3.0, but have not made any decisions about whether to upgrade from the legacy digital system. And I'm happy to say I just came home from Toronto where I saw the beautiful lab that they're building there at Humber College, a college of 50,000 students, and they have a three transmitter single frequency network up and running, and they're about to install their 5G core network, so very exciting there. And Mexico is also seeking to light up an experimental transmitter with distance education as a primary use case. This is in the early stages, but if I was a betting person, I would expect they would have experimental 3.0 signals on the air within the next 12 to 18 months. Money, don't write that down. <laughs> Money, don't. Excellent. My guess, Maddie's crystal ball, for what it's worth. Returning to the U.S., Chairwoman Rose Morsel's announcement at the NAB show last month was welcome news. She announced the formation of the Future of TV, a new public-private initiative to consider how to complete the transition to 3.0. This was huge news. In fact, I was in another room completely, another meeting completely, and some